Episode 29, back. Chris is back. Just been chatting offline, just random stuff. Olympic Games in Queensland. Don't know why. Um, but we thought we'd go in and chat about we're both carrying annoying hamstring injuries at the moment. I was going to say it's probably an age-based thing, but my hamstring injuries have been around in my entire life. You've had a few hamstring injuries throughout your life as well, so it's not always an age-based thing. However, mine's come about from recently just upping my – actually, I – I thought initially was upping my volume too quickly, but it wasn't. I went off and ran some hills, quite a steep hill, a little bit too fast one day, niggled my hamstring a bit, then that has turned into a high hamstring tendinopathy. Um, and interestingly enough, tendinopathies, all the research now shows that you need to strengthen them. Just do low-grade strength work, and they will just progressively improve. And I do find the moment I focus on it, and just doing things like, bridging on the ground but you've got to most people make the mistake they go into their flat foot you've got to bridge off your heel just bridging on the ground lifting your butt off the ground um and doing volume of that sort of stuff like it improves rapidly after three days i can actually feel improvement but i just ran seven k's this morning and i noticed it flared up a little bit Mm -hmm. annoying though but um yeah as soon as i do any sort of hamstring work for it um and i found an amazing youtube video the other day by physios to physios in the us that also just have quite a substantial youtube channel with like 30 minutes of um hamstring rehab work for tendinopathies and it was a full progression like you know from how to test it to what to do um all the way through your progression and it was such a good video so but there's ways around it it's like all these things mate i'm sure you would agree um it's a discipline thing when you've got these particularly when they're niggly injuries like for mine i can still run with mine So it's not enough to stop me. So you just get a little bit lazy and don't put enough focus on it. Um, But if I get focused on it, I can actually reduce it down very quickly. But I noticed today I had a bit more speed work to do today and um, it's just flared up a little bit. So you're the same, got a bit of a niggle as well. Yeah, well, I I mean, sprinting's a slightly different in terms of if, if you've got a slight strain, you can't push. Um, it's it, two things are going to happen. It either, it either it's painful or you'll do more damage. Um, I'm currently just doing all my normal rehab, which is um, strength work in the gym, water training, and um, I'm doing hills because hills doesn't load it um, like track. Um, yeah. You can lean into the hill, get under your hip, and it shortens your stride length. I'm only getting a little bit of discomfort when I'm going to full stride length, but it's improving. It's improving every day. I can get more and more out every day, so it's improving. Whether it will improve in time for me to get to nationals, I don't know. I may even can nationals. I mightn't go. Um, and I might. They're have- in. Did you say they're in Hobart? Hobart, yeah. Yeah. When yeah. at Easter? At Easter. Easter's early this year, we found out yesterday. It's the 30th of March. Yes. So Very early. you only got six weeks. I oh, know, eight weeks, nine eight. weeks. So eight or nine weeks is enough time. Yeah. I still, because I've got some good base under me. I've, if I can get this right in the next uh, one to two weeks, I can still get into 80, 90% shape by the end of March. Yeah. It's doable. But if it's not to be, that's fine because Oceania has come up in May. Um, I'll just take it. I'll take a break and I'll refocus and get ready for that, and then decide on whether to do one more international event, and then before I um, hang hang the spikes up and and call it quits on it, well, all all that sort of stuff, and just run domestically for a couple of years and just unwind it all. Um, yeah. Uh, but um, like everything in life, um, even with all these, and I've had lots of injuries and hamstring strains and all sorts of strains over the course of my entire sporting career, at some point, it has to end for everyone. 100%. It's, there's no, and, and it's, I know it's for a lot of people, it's difficult because, um, you know, if you make something so much a part of your life and now it's gone or it's about to go, that can be really stressful. So. You have to think about that and plan for that and manage that well so you don't give yourself 
any kind of psychological dramas because people carry that um, and it's a and it can be quite a corrosive and destructive thing in your life if you don't it's almost like when men work their whole lives in a profession and don't plan for their retirement properly or when they can't do that job they just keep doing the job ignoring the fact and then when that day comes they're a mess they're just a just a, an emotional mess and guess what else they do they curl their toes up and die yeah and that's really dumb but it's that's a- what- people do so with with my career and with the little niggles i've got and bits and pieces i'm I'm, i've been on a knife edge probably for the last five years in i've been able to get my body good enough to to compete um on a very good level but then i'm i'm just hanging on by shoestring is that i'm only one kind of strain away from going there's no i have no more to give yeah and that's every athlete, by the way, that's ever put on a pair of any football boots, whether it's soccer, tennis, I don't care what the sport is. If you've played or competed at a good level, then you're on a timer. Yeah, 100%. Everyone is. If you want to, if you haven't played. If you want to be a local park mug and just run around and, um, and perform at a really low level for 50, good luck. You do it. I'm not saying it's a bad thing. Heaps of people do that, and that's good for them. But if you comp- if you're at a high level, that's um, that is unsustainable for a long period. It just is for anyone. And I'll yeah. I'll, I'll um, and maybe there is someone, and who knows? But uh, I'll, I'll, you'd struggle to find a handful of athletes in any sport that have just gone on for decades and have just been unconquerable. That just doesn't happen. Yeah, I think most people, it, um, I think there'd be a, a very high percentage of athletes out there that injuries become their unwinding of their career. You hear of so many footballers that I'm seeing that have been following the UFC for probably 20 years now and seeing the UFC fighters, you know, coming back from the second and third shoulder surgery or the second and third knee construction and they're just like, I can't go through it again. I've just, you know... 12 months of rehab each time and then get back and then start doing it again. You just can't do it again. So, yeah, it's interesting. But um, uh, what are you typically doing with your hamstring injury? Uh, um, in terms of rehab for me, obviously um, uh, deep water rehab is um, is a staple because it's just, um, you know, you can get – you can push your hamstring um, through to fatigue under quite a bit of duress without doing any – injury to it at all or any um you can't really do any more damage it doesn't irritate it and it's good strength work the other work that i'm doing um is uh, uh, is mainly my full range of um hamstring curls i'm doing um some single leg uh leg press um exercises some very very measured and targeted um uh squats um, I'm doing some very, very gentle um, double leg nor mm-hmm. so They're my they're my go to. Um, but one of the keys to when you're doing bridging um, with uh, your hamstring is make sure you do isometrics, do holds. Yeah. So I do up to ten and twelve and fifteen and even twenty second isometric holds on my hamstring. Yep. And, and then build up to single leg holds. Yeah. Um, and things like that. Now, this is so slight for me. Like, I can run on it. Like, I mean, I can run, you know, 70, 80%. I can run and it's not a problem. Like, and I can do hill work at 90 to 95%. So it's not yeah. bad. It's only minor, but it's certainly enough to stop you sprinting. And that's Yeah, for sure. <clears throat> sprint, you've got to be 100%. You can't be not. Yeah. <laughs> Otherwise, you're just going to run terrible. Yeah. So uh, whether I can get it right in um, in the next one to two weeks and then get the training in, I need to be competitive in in Hobart. That remains to be seen. But if I can't do it, um, I'm not going to beat myself up about it. I'll just say, well, it is what it is. I mean, I'll I'll skip that event and rebuild into Oceania. Um, yeah, sure. And uh, and because this is my last really competitive year in uh, or last season in in track. Um, I really do want to. Um, I'm, you do get very tired of waking up in the morning and hobbling to the bathroom. Yeah. 
because of the session you did the night before, it's just you wake up and you've laid there in bed for eight hours, your body's all stiff and you wake up going, oh my God, this feels horrible. I've been doing this so long now. I just want to wake up and feel normal. Yeah, I get it. I don't know if we, um, I don't know if I'd wake up even if I didn't work out anymore and still feel normal. I'm pretty bashed up again at the moment, but I am, I'm running a lot for me. Um, and I've just got heavy quads all the time, but just going back to hamstring stuff, just explain to explain what you do in the pool. I don't think a lot of people really know about pool running and pool work. And I was chatting to someone the other day about the amount of pool, even just sessions we used to do in the pool just to actually, um, get a bit of a rest in it sometimes, you know, when you're training in these high levels that you can just go and do these pool sessions and take a bit of stress for your body, but still get a good workout in. So just talk a little bit about what you what you typically do in the pool. Yeah, it's, um, and interestingly, and I'm really surprised at how many people are not um, across uh, um, pool rehab. So it's um, one of the things that you need to do is get yourself, you know, one of those um, buoyancy belts, a belt you strap around yourself, and you need to get one that's big enough that if you're um, just motionless in the water, in deep water, and that's the other component of this is you, you can't feet can't touch the ground or the bottom of the pool yes. it's got to be in deep water otherwise it, yeah. it doesn't work as effectively but you need a buoyancy belt on that if you're motionless you won't sink your head yeah. must remain above water then you can isolate the the um uh, particularly your lower um uh, body um limbs and the mechanics of that you can isolate that and do it properly so one of the things that we do as sprinters in deep water rehab is mimic um, what we would do on a track. So you're mimicking the actions, whether it be um, like butt kicks, um, uh, going through that um, cyclic rotation um, of when you're actually running. So you go through your upper body mechanic, your drive phase leg down through the water, and then bringing that heel back up as well. So that cyclic rhythmic running you do that in the water. Now you can vary that um, with stride length, with how um, uh, high your knees come up, all of those types, there are variations to it, but that's the core part of your rehab. And the other thing is that we'll do, I'll do some lateral work, which is not mimicking running, but it's just still strengthening up things like abductors and adductors when you're doing crossovers with your legs and just different types of exercises that are just doing an overall fitness um component as opposed to the exact mechanic of running so but so typically yeah. um how so you're in a deeper pool i recall when we used to do them we used to often go in the diving pool and there was no one in there and that you're doing a really deep pool so you need to do them in deeper water um and how far are you traveling across the pool or how what sort of distance are you traveling when you're in the water running well, I mean, I, we used to travel um, back in the uh, many years ago when I was doing it, I would be traveling at least 20 meters, sometimes 25 meters. I don't yeah. do that anymore. Um, I'm only traveling um, about 10 meters and going yeah. and going back. I don't, you don't need to, to cover ground. It's not like it's a race where you've got to get from A to B. It's more about the actual movement you're doing than the ground you're covering, which is exactly what we tell our athletes when it comes to some of their drills. A lot of people with their drills, I mean, we've had, I've had some athletes that go 50 metres for a drill. Yeah. And try to explain to them, why are you covering so much ground? That doesn't make any sense. Do the action. You know, the action is the drill. It's not the ground you cover. So it's more about getting that mechanic right. And the water's no different. So you get in the water, as long as you're doing the mechanic and mimicking that action that, that's, um, that gives your hamstring the problem, and you're rehabbing it in that fashion, then you don't have to cover ground. Um, you know, in, in some instances, you don't go anywhere. You can just be in exactly the same spot and yeah. in that action. So what's more important than anything is the action and, not, and as I say, not the ground you cover. Um, but as I say, the three main components um, of water rehab is you must have a buoyancy thing around your waist, you must be in deep water, and you must... Um, uh, work the um, the injured or strained area in the same way as you would if you were on the track. Yeah. That's how so typically, um, how long are you spending 
in the water for these sessions? Uh, it's, I mean, we used to do them for, uh, over 45 minutes. Now I'm, I'm down to about 30. I'm finding 30 minutes is enough. Yeah, yeah, I would have thought 25 to 30 minutes. You're pretty fatigued. Well, you do fatigue, but it's also, if you're doing that in combination with other exercises, I've found that that is enough. Yeah, and are you just doing the water running on um, in isolation on one particular day, then doing the rehab exercise the next day, or how are you actually breaking the week up? No, I, I'll often, I, I like to actually um, uh, go to the gym and do my rehab there and then just do 30 minutes in the pool. Yeah, okay. So you're doing it on the same day. Then what about the following day? What would you do? Um, on the following day, I'm, I'm doing uh, probably water. I'm only doing like um, every other day, like or, or mm. maybe only three times a week. And I'm trying to get into the, to the gym, you know, um, four to five days a week. For, for at least 20 minutes of rehab. Yeah. It's um it's interesting. I recall when we used to do a lot of water running and we used to sometimes swap out sessions, go and do water sessions, just to have a break of the track. Um, the one thing I used to get when you hadn't done the water running for a while was sore hip flexors. Just yeah. that driving through the additional weight, you know, sort of, you know, pulling your leg through the water, you get quite fatigued hip flexors, which, you know, over a period of time is also beneficial as well. But yeah, I agree. It's um, something I haven't done with my hamstring. Um, and I have a pool at home uh, in the in the complex, but it's actually not deep enough to actually um, run in. I can walk on the bottom in it. You know, it's only sort of waist deep water, but I can't actually go and run in it. Yeah, and walking on the bottom of a pool is not and, – and not saying, by the way, there are um, – um, there is some functionality and some benefit to even being in a pool and um, your feet touching the ground. There are things you can do. If you don't have deep water, it's not to say that you can't get some benefit and do some good things even if you're touching the ground. It's just not as good as being in deep Yeah, water. I agree. Because you can walk backwards and so forth just in the yeah. on the bottom. You still get some resistance training, particularly that low-grade resistance, which to start off is really important. But, um, yeah, interesting. One of the things that, you know, and I've got this tendinopathy, you're better off not stretching it, and they actually like to be worked at that low grade. And as you said, some of that static work as well, you go from those, you know, static bridge work to, you know, static or bridge holds, and then you can do single leg stuff from double leg and single legs. Then you can actually start to do some, some um, bridge movement work. And then also, you know, even some weighted bridge work, where you can start to put some weight on your, on your hips and actually start to do some, uh, some bridges with a bit of weight, both double and single leg. So it's all about just working at that progression as well. And, and one of the things that, because we get a lot of hamstring strains in, in track, of course, there's one thing that I'm constantly fascinated by that people don't understand and get wrong. This is the single thing that it, that people who, who don't um, understand this process, they always get wrong. They, they, they strain the hamstring and the first thing they want to do is stretch it. Yeah. They start stretching and I, and static stretching. And I'm like, stop stretching it. It's, it's upset. It's probably got some inflammation. It may have a slight, it may have some micro tears and you want to pull on it. Yeah. Pull it. And I'm like, stop doing it. The, 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 what you've got to do is let it settle. It's trying to shorten itself to protect itself. And you just, it's like a frayed elastic band. You keep pulling it, pulling it, eventually it'll break. So I've got to, got to get people to stop stretching their hamstrings when they've got a um, slight strain do all the rehab and the stretching comes last. It's the most yeah. common thing to see is that people, when they get in, they're like, oh, I've got to stretch it. And they worse, they're even worse, they stretch it cold. That's the first thing they do. Yeah. Oh, the first thing they do, they're cold, they've done the exercise, they've done no dynamic warm-up, nothing, and they start stretching their hamstring. And I'm like, oh, you're just prolonging the, um, the healing. The problem with stretching is that um, for the majority of people that don't understand, it feels good, right? It just feels like your hamstrings all gathered up. I, I, I feel like I want to lengthen this thing out. So for a lot of people, it just actually feels good. But yeah, you're right. It just does has no, no. Um, well, it's actually disadvantageous. But uh, yeah, it's a weird thing that we want to stretch. But yeah, and it is about that low grade um, uh, loading of the hamstring. And it's interesting over the years, you know, once upon a time when we were younger, Everything was about get ice on or something straight away and, you know, leave it for a few days and don't do anything with it and then start stretching it. Now it's all about, 
maybe if you've got massive inflammation, get some ice onto it, but it's more about, you know, get heat into it for blood flow these days and um, then start using the hamstring or the particular muscle that's injured quite quickly to start, you know, helping it um, heal and start really setting up those fibres that it's the new fibres that start to lay down in the, the correct manner and start getting some strength back into that area. So, yeah, the tendonopathy that I have there, it's actually very annoying because it's high up and it's an overuse injury and I just can't shake it. I can still run. I can still do all my training. I can't run hills. The tendonopathy feels like it drags when I run up hills. So right. I avoid hills at the moment. And when I increase the speed, and again, I've gone back to distance running, but this morning I was running some um, speed repeat stuff and it does kick in the gear when I do a bit more speed work. But I found the other day I did some standing hamstring curls and i found those better for me than lying hamstring curls now it must just change the proximal sort of angle that my hamstrings you know working at but the standing just feels like it's not dragging on that high sort of hamstring area as much as opposed to when i lie um and i don't really know the biomechanics why it feels that way but it just felt more comfortable for me well, there's the, the two there's two machines in our gym. One is a seated hamstring curl, so you're seated mm-hmm. like that, mm-hmm. pulling that way. And yes, I know it. There's our standing hamstring curl, which is really good for eccentric loading. So what you do is you stand, do a full um, curl with your foot, so you you've got um, a weight on it, and then you have your heel touching your bum, and hold it there for a couple of yeah. seconds, and slowly release down. To, and, and you've got to go full range of motion. So you pull it up, hold it, and then eccentrically load it as, as you're lowering it down. And that's from a standing position. And I, I do that as well. That's one of the things that I put in my rotation um, on my exercises. And it, it is a very good rehabilitative um, exercise for hamstrings. Um, and you can change it around again from eccentric to concentric is then you stay at the bottom, take the weight, um, on a very, very slow, um, you've just got your foot off the ground and then pull it up slow and release yeah. quickly and pull it up slow and release quickly. So you could do it, you do it both ways to get that hamstring and those, as you said, laying down those fibers again to get that little strain, that little injury strong. I think the other thing from a running point of view, it probably has some benefit or more benefit around it because you're in that standing position, which is your running position as opposed to laying down. And a lot of these benches, as you well know, these um, lying hamstring curl machines that, you know, they're quite pitched in the middle where the um, uh, the bend in the seat is or the bend in the bench is. So yeah. it's pushing your hips right up in the air, which is technically not the way you're running. So I think the standing hamstring machine, you're having to stabilise with the glute on the other side because you're standing on that one foot. So you're actually activating that glute in a strong hold sort of fashion, and then you're using that hamstring through what is more replicating the running range. So I think that's, you know, technically is probably a better exercise as well, but it definitely felt better for me. Yeah, and, and, and I coach that way is that I coach, when I talk to people about sprinting, I say everything we do on and off track is just designed to mimic this action. Yeah. So it, the, our sport isn't like, um, soccer or other sports that have many, many skills that they need to combine. This is one very, very specific skill that you need to get right, and um, which is why training can be often boring for a lot of people. There's not a lot of variation because you're just training your body to do one task and do that one task really, really well. Yeah, for sure. You don't need athletes to be good at 10 things. I just need to be good at one thing. And I know... Yeah there's lots of ways to get there and there's lots of exercise and lots of things you can do, but ultimately you are just trying to achieve one specific thing. So, um, which is very different to a lot of other sports, you know, um, where you have lots of skills to, um, to learn. Um, This, as I always say to people, it's one of the old things that I say, you know, if you look at kids when they first learn to walk, almost all kids at some point learn to walk. And then eventually they'll run. Now, every kid, when they reach a certain age, is going to try and run. So they, yeah. can, so they all run. Very few of them, and hardly any, can run well. And that's the difference, is running, running 
and running well is like looking, is arriving in Antarctica and saying we're going to walk to the to the South Pole. That's how running and running well, the chasm between that, it's massive. And people yeah. get it because they think, well, what? everyone runs. How hard could it be? Well, guess yeah. what? <laughs> Come down and try it and see how you go. And I got a new guy now that's coming down. He's only young. He's only 36. And great sports person. Played all different sports, everything. Last night, had him on the track. He was just doing I, very slow, 50 60%, 80s. He got to the end of um, six of those. And he said, Bob, oh, cooked. Done. Yeah. He was foot collapsing. His um, calves started to lock up. His um, Achilles were, he just he couldn't even hold his foot, um, his heel off the ground. And this is a strong guy. Strong yeah, guy. I think track is very specific, though. I think most people can run, whether they run well, even distance. Majority of people have a better chance of, you know, you see some horrible people that can still run marathons, right? They get through um, biomechanically, they don't look great. And you wonder if they were biomechanically any better, whether they'd be, you know, run better times, you know, be more efficient, blah, blah, blah. But then you up that to some form of, you know, higher speed running and then progress to track running. And then it's a very, very different, you know, um, kettle of fish altogether. It just changes. The dynamics change so much. So yeah, it's a, you know, and I, I don't think you can, if someone doesn't have, Really good running technique. I think even trying to teach that as a track runner is, you know, very, very difficult. Well, and, and interestingly, if you look at, um, it doesn't matter whether you look at, say, the Boston Marathon or the or any marathon that everyone manages to go in, for the person that runs it in, in two hours and one minute and the person that runs it in four and a half hours, okay, there's a very distinct difference between those two runners. But here's the interesting thing I say about um, running in general. If you look at a 100-meter runner and a marathon runner and every distance in between from 100s to 800s to 1500s to 10K to half marathon to marathon and look at all the elite runners in all those particular events, look at their mechanics sure, and their central themes with a lot of them. Even a marathon runner is running with exactly the same um, uh, um uh, backside mechanics as a sprinter. Same. Elite marathon runners, yeah. Elite. I'm talking elite. That's, yeah, sure, sure. That's why I say everyone can run. Everyone could probably, even if they put their mind to it, train and get through a marathon. Yeah. But they're not going to look like um, Kipchoge. No. They're not going to look that's, like Noah I mean, the difference there is that that marathon runner is also doing a lot of track work. You know, he's actually doing... 1K repeats, you know, and stuff like that. So his speed is just phenomenal. So, yeah, it's very, very different for sure. But my point is that someone can go off and run a marathon. Look, everyone can run 100 metres as well, but it's a very different skill to learn. Like anyone can go for a, you know, a, a 3K run around the streets. It may not look pretty at all, but um, running down the track is a very different thing. And it requires a different, as you were saying before, a different tendon strength nearly like your tendons you know being able to stay in your toes and we all know those nights when you're doing huge volume and you start to just collapse and your whole body just sinks down your hips are sort of you know feel like they're stuck on the track and you know that's when it is time to give up but yeah you you find me a mug park runner or even a mug marathon runner um versus an elite marathon or or, or someone that can run you know like a a 28 minute 10k and you find me some mug park runner and say to him um, so what have you been doing lately to um, work on your lower body mechanics? And they look at you like you've got two heads. They're like, "Yeah, body mechanic. What would I worry about? I'll just go run. I don't worry about that rubbish." But get yeah. going, elite runner, a marathon runner. What he's doing for his body mechanics, and he'll get and he'll and th you'll just lose two hours of your life because he'll yeah. start explaining it to you. That's the difference because every, yeah. every person that runs well does that. But everyone that doesn't run well, that just tries to get better by doing more volume or just push harder, doesn't. Sure. You know what I mean? And that's the real fundamental thing that I see when I when new people come to the track. Um, you know, and I say to them, I say, you know, you can spend the rest of your life just training harder, but you're never going to get much better. Yeah. Simply because you're not going to fix this problem. And you don't want to fix it. And that's fine. It doesn't worry me. 
you can do whatever you like, but that's the thing. And I had to, I am exact an athlete the other day, done my head in. I just said, you know what? You've got two choices. I can either tell you something that's going to make you happy or that I can tell you the truth. Yeah. <laughs> what do you want to hear? What do you want to hear? And of course they always say, no, tell me the truth. Oh, no, they didn't want to hear that. Oh, I didn't want that. I didn't know you Yeah, exactly. To... Oh, yeah. Oh, and I got really, I mean, this girl savaged me. She was like, oh, I thought we were friends. <laughs> and I said, we are. That's what I'm telling you. Because yeah. the problem is I keep telling you because we are friends the things you want to hear and it's not helping you. Yeah. So I have to tell you the truth. And it's just like the worst thing is we've been filming her, doing this, going, look at your mechanics. It's, it's, this is why you're having problems. And, oh, my God. It was, and I said, that's it. I'm done. I'm not coaching anymore. You're done. Yeah, it's, it's, there's, a, there's, a, <laughs> there's a limit with everyone, mate. <laughs> Well, there's a limit with everyone and you're still hitting yourself over the head with a hammer while you're talking to the doctor explaining to the doctor that i don't know why i keep getting headaches i can't yeah. figure it out while you're hitting yourself over the head with a hammer and the doctor looks at you and goes i hate to break this to you but it might be the fact that you're using a hammer to hit yourself over the head and then you say yeah. no 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 it's not that <laughs> it's everything but that and i'm just yeah. doing this and you're going to figure out the problem because this is your fault. You tell me why I've got headaches, and because it, it's and don't say hammer. If I hear you say that again, you're fired. <laughs> what do you do with a brain like that? You can't be helped. You just got to say, mate, go, you're gone, done, finished. Yeah, you're an idiot. Well, yeah. Anyway, well, that's it. I agree. <laughs> <laughs> All right, on that note, we might leave it there. I need to uh, get off to a few meetings as well. So all good, bit of rehab stuff on hamstrings. I'm hoping mine goes away pretty soon. Me too. And uh, we'll, um, we'll jump on a call next week. Done. All right, mate. Have a great day. Yeah, you too. Cheers. Bye. Later.